attendees. Hi everyone, we're going to get started in just a minute. We're gonna make sure everyone has a chance to log on, but I see a lot of you are already waiting for the webinar to start. Thank you so much for being on time. Uh, and if you don't know me already, I am Morgan Green Griffin. I am the Teen Services Librarian at the Cosby Library. And I am so pumped to be introducing Erin Yoon today. She is the author of Pippa Park Raises Her Game. Um, she is a debut author who actually grew up in Frisco, Texas. So that's like just around the corner from us. She received a bachelor's in fine arts and English from New York University. And she served as president of its policy debate team. So this experience came in super handy for Erin as she became the debate consultant for the Tony nominated best play on Broadway, What the Constitution Means to Me. So she has a background in Broadway, which is pretty cool. Uh, and she is also a member of the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. And she has written reviews and articles for Book Browse and Yes. She did used to play basketball as a middle grader. And so some of her experience is in her book and I'm sure Erin has a lot to tell us about that. Um, so I am going to spotlight Erin and let her get started. As, we, as she presents, feel free to ask questions at any time through the Q&A function of the webinar. And uh, when we get to a point where we're answering those questions, I'm gonna be keeping an eye on them and then I will relay those to Erin, okay? And um, you know, if you have any questions specific um, that maybe I need to help you with, you can use the chat function to chat um, with me personally, if you need any sort of technical help, okay? And I'm gonna turn it over to Erin. Hi, y'all. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen with you first so you can just see this and then I'll play that. So everybody should be able to see the screen, right? I perfect. Hi, y'all. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Morgan, and a huge thank you to Cosby Library for everything y'all have done to support me. Like you said, I actually grew up in Frisco, Texas, which you can probably tell based on how much I say y'all. So it feels really special for me to be here talking to y'all about my debut book, The Park Raises Her Game. So I'll tell you more about my book in a second, but first I want to tell you a little bit about myself and how I actually became an author. So a lot of times kids will ask me, how do they become an author? And I think luck definitely plays a huge role in that. But if I had any advice to give you today, this quote by Stephen King sums it up quite nicely. And that's, if you wanna be a writer, you must do two things above all others. One, read a lot, and two, write a lot. I think the second half of this quote, write a lot, makes sense to a lot of people. After all, if you're a writer, you should write. But to me, that means taking a little bit of almost every day just to write something small. And it doesn't have to be anything big like working on a novel or even a short story. It could be as simple as transcribing a conversation you overheard your friends talking about on Zoom earlier today. Or maybe you write one paragraph about how amazing the pizza was for dinner last night. Or one paragraph about how terrible the pizza was for dinner last night. What you write isn't so important as the fact that you're writing because that will really strengthen the muscles necessary to become an author in the long run. But at the same time, I think the first half of this quote, read a lot, means even more to me. When I was a kid, my parents really made sure that I read all the time. And I'm so grateful for that because reading is really what teaches you the skills necessary to become a writer. It will introduce you to new genres and new perspectives. Plus, as a reader, you know when a character feels timeless and important, but you also know when a plot point feels kind of weak or uninspired. In other words, reading is what teaches you what good writing should look like. So now let me tell you a little bit about my own book, Pippa Park Raises Her Game. Pippa Park Raises Her Game is about a Korean American girl named Pippa who receives a mysterious basketball scholarship to her local private school and becomes determined to use this opportunity as a chance to reinvent herself. 
both to impress her fancy new friends, as well as an impossibly cute crush on the side. It's a book about first friendships, new crushes, and the ups and downs of family. But above everything else, it's about one girl who, in trying to fit in, learns that maybe she's meant to stand out instead. So Pip Park Races Her Game is actually what is known as a fractured classic. And for those of you who haven't heard this term before, a fractured classic is basically a retelling of a classic book. So you can think about it like a block of Legos. So when you're playing with a block of Legos, first you start out with something like a truck, and then you take apart those Lego blocks and build something entirely new, like a plane. You're using the same Lego blocks, but at the same time, you're building an entirely new shape. And that's my goal, at least, when I'm writing a retelling. So I've always loved fractured classics and more broadly retellings, and I think this quote by Neil Gaiman sums up why I like them so much. And that's we have the right and the obligation to tell old stories in our own ways, because they are our stories. Classic books are amazing because they have timeless themes and really interesting characters, but at the same time, we're all going to relate to those themes in our own personal ways. So retellings are really a way for you to let your own perspective shine through. So if any of that was confusing, don't worry because I'm sure you've either heard, read, or seen some retellings in your own personal life. So maybe a few of you have seen Romeo and Juliet, which is a play by Shakespeare. And for those of you who haven't read this or seen this, it's about a young girl and a young boy from feuding families, so their families are fighting, but they end up falling in love and actually dying for this forbidden love they share. So if you haven't seen Romeo and Juliet, maybe you have seen Nomeo and Juliet before. Nomeo and Juliet is about these red gnomes who are neighbors with these blue gnomes. And again, two of the gnomes end up falling in love with each other, but it's a lot less bleak than the original and nobody dies. Meanwhile, I'm sure most of you have probably seen High School Musical before, but did you know that this was also inspired by Romeo and Juliet? So in High School Musical, you have a young academic girl who falls in love with a basketball jock and their friend groups are trying to keep them apart, but again, nobody dies, and instead they end up bonding over the school musical. So you can see that retellings can be really close to the original, like Nomeo and Juliet, or more far away, like High School Musical, and either is totally fine. So hopefully you'll actually be able to think of a few more retellings that you've seen in your own personal life. I actually find that it's kind of like a scavenger hunt where once you find one retelling, you start seeing them all over the place. So if you want to drop any retelling examples in the chat below, I would love to see them later. Okay, so now that we know what a retelling is, let's talk about what kind of stories can be retold. In general, books take inspiration from other books all the time. But if you're looking to retell a specific book, you have to make sure that it's not copyrighted. Some of you may have heard the term copyright before, but for those of you who haven't, copyright laws basically help writers protect their book for a certain period of time. So if a book is copyrighted, it means that the content of that book legally belongs to the author and other people can't use or copy that content without the author's permission. So that means no matter how much you love Percy Jackson and the Olympians, you can't just rewrite that series and make a bajillion dollars. Likewise, you couldn't rewrite a book called Percy Maxson and the Bolympians about a boy who goes to Camp Quarterblood and also make a bajillion dollars because that would still be violating copyright and would be considered plagiarism. So hopefully some of your teachers have taught you about plagiarism before, but basically plagiarism is just when you copy someone else's work without their permission, which is definitely not allowed when you're retelling a book. However, there are some books that you can retell, and those are books in the public domain. So if you haven't heard the term public domain before, that's totally fine. I didn't learn about it until high school or even college, but essentially books in the public domain are books that are not copyrighted any longer. So there are a lot of weird, bizarre rules about when a book gets so old that it goes into the public domain. But in general, if you want to retell a specific story, you can Google it and see if it's old enough to be in the public domain and see if you can use that work. In the upcoming years, there are so many books that I'm personally excited about coming into the public domain. But one of my favorite books, The Great Gatsby, actually enters the public domain in 2021. So in just a few months from now, I'm sure we'll be seeing tons of retellings about that book. So I know that copyright in the public domain can be a little bit tricky concepts. So if you have any questions now about either the copyright stuff or the public domain stuff, feel free to drop that in the chat and either Morgan can relay that to me or I can answer that later. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about what makes my own book, Pip Park Raises Her Game, a fractured classic of great expectations. 
So for those of you who haven't heard of Great Expectations, it's a very, very old book by a man named Charles Dickens. And it's about a boy named Pip who receives help from a mysterious stranger who gives him the funds necessary in order to become educated. And in a lot of ways, Pippa Park is similar to Great Expectations. Both books start out with a very mysterious stranger. In Great Expectation, Pips meet a criminal in the cemetery and it's very eerie and scary and he doesn't know really what the criminal is doing there. And I won't spoil the intrigue or tension of this book, but I will say that there is a lot of mystery surrounding who this criminal is and what role he plays in Pip's life. Meanwhile, in Pippa Park Races Her Game, Pippa meets a mysterious teenager in the forest. And he's not a criminal, but it is raining in this huge storm and he's playing the violin of all things in the woods. And again, I won't spoil the story for you, but there is a lot of intrigue about who this teenager is. Both books also feature a very unfriendly love interest. I don't know if anyone watching has ever had a crush before, but Pippa falls head over heels for her tutor, who she thinks is just the cutest boy in the world. And even though he's actually quite rude to her, she's determined to make him fall for her too. Another similarity is that both books feature themes of ambition and opportunity. Pippa is determined to become the world's best basketball player and she won't let anyone stand in her way. And finally, another similarity is some of the family relationships in the book. So in Great Expectations, Pip has this brother-in-law named Joe and he's just the sweetest, kindest, most humble man you could ever meet. And I like the relationship so much that I decided to copy it for my own book. So in Pippa Park, she has a brother-in-law named Jean-Pla, who's also just the kindest man you could wish to have for a brother-in-law and is always there to listen to her or even give her some snack money when she's feeling down. But at the same time, you want your retelling to have lots of fresh twists and turns of its own. So there was a lot of ways that I made Pippa Park unique as well. And one of the biggest unique twists is that Pip is now Pippa, a spunky 12-year-old first-generation Korean-American girl with a passion for basketball. Another difference is that my book takes place in modern times. This might not sound like a huge difference at first, but, def but Dickens definitely didn't have a cell phone and he definitely, definitely didn't have social media, both of which play a pretty huge role in my own book. Another difference is that unlike Pip, Pippa isn't an orphan. I thought it was a little bit too grim to have both of her parents dead. So her mom is alive. She lives in Korea. So Pippa is living with her sister and her brother-in-law in America away from her. And finally, another difference is most of the third part of the book. So I often find when you're making a retelling that the beginning of the book starts out pretty similar because you're feeling fresh and inspired. But as you get to know your characters more, they actually make their own choices a little bit and it starts to veer the book in a very different direction than you might have imagined in the first place, which I really like. So in addition to being inspired by Great Expectations, I also took a lot of personal inspiration from my own life. I'm half Korean, and so a lot of details from my own childhood make their way into Pippa's life as well, such as our favorite Korean dramas or our favorite foods. Maybe some of you out there have seen Boys Over Flowers before, but this used to be my favorite K-drama back in eighth or ninth grade. And back in the day, I remember having to illegally download it online, but now it's actually available on places like Hulu and Netflix, so it's really cool to see just how much more accessible K-dramas are in the US now. Another thing that me and Pippa share in common is our taste in food. So if any of y'all watching like spicy food, you should definitely check out Dukbuki, which is this amazing dish of rice cakes in this spicy, slightly sweet sauce with sometimes eggs or fish cakes thrown in. It's absolutely delicious. My stomach is grumbling just talking about it now. And I might be a little bit biased, but I think that Korea has some of the best ice cream in the world. So over here on the right, you can see my favorite ice cream ever, which is these Korean watermelon popsicles. So if you have an H Mart near you, I highly recommend checking those out. They're delicious. In general, I find giving my characters just one or two things in common with me is a really great way for me to feel more connected to them. And so if you like writing, you could always try doing the same thing. And it doesn't have to be anything big, even just a small detail like your favorite food or your favorite TV show can really help you connect with your character and learn more about how their mind works. And speaking of which, maybe a few of you out there are writers and maybe a few of you struggle with either coming up with ideas for characters or getting to know their characters a little bit more fully. And that makes total sense because I struggle with this all the time. And so now I'm gonna share with you a few of the tips I like to use whenever I'm struggling. So one of those tips is I actually like to draw my characters. And I know I'm not the best artist by any means, but over here on the left, you can see an, a little picture I did of Pippa from the outline stages. 
And I really love drawing my characters because it gives me a better kind of image of them in my head. So when I write, I know how to describe them more fully. And another thing I like to do is actually create Spotify playlists for my characters. So this can be as simple as creating a playlist of songs that your character likes or listens to, or you can add songs that you think describe your character or maybe even describe a particular chapter that you're struggling with. And the reason I like to do these two things is because even though you're not writing, you're still doing something creative, you're either drawing or listening to music. And so I find that when you go back to writing, you're still in that artistic mindset and you feel really inspired and just ready to get writing. But at the same time, I think the third tip I have is the tip that I like to use most often, and that's taking personality quizzes for my characters. So if you Google something like the Myers-Briggs test, it will take you to a giant personality quiz that will ask you all sorts of questions from, are you often late or do you like to go to parties? And I like to fill out these quizzes from the point of view of my own characters. So in Pippa's case, it'd be like, yes, she's late all the time. And I find that this really helps you think of details that you might have missed before or just even give you a chance to think about things that you might not have thought about before. So these are a few of the tips that I like to use. And if you have any questions about my writing process or creating a character, feel free again to just drop them in the chat below. So in a second, we're gonna talk about point of view, and then we're actually gonna work on making our own retellings together. But first, I want to walk you through the process of making a first draft into a finished novel. So I think it's important to remember that no book, or at least almost no book, is done after the first draft. First you write, and then you edit, and then you edit a little bit more, and a little bit more, and you get the picture, but it's a whole lot of editing. So I wrote the first draft of Pippa in probably about two to three months, but it took about three to four times as long to edit the book. So you can see that I spent so much more time in the editing phase than I did in the writing phase. And to some readers and writers, this might sound a little bit intimidating, but I actually find it really reassuring because a lot of times people will finish the first draft of their novel and then they'll say, well, this isn't as good as what I see on the shelves. But it's important to remember that no book is ever as good as what you see on the shelves after a first draft. Editing is really what makes your book shine. So if you finish the first draft of your novel, you should feel incredibly proud of yourself because not a lot of people even get that far. And then you should get to editing. Okay, so before we work on our own retellings together, let's talk a little bit about point of view. And maybe some of your teachers have talked to you about point of view before, but for a little refresher, a point of view is basically the voice in which a story is told and its relationship to the event in the story. Okay, you might be asking, but what does that mean? So essentially to figure out point of view, you just wanna ask yourself, who is telling the story? Is it a narrator who knows every detail about everyone, like a mind reader, or is it an individual like you or me who only knows what they're experiencing? Asking those kind of questions is gonna really help you find out what point of view you're reading. And there are three different types of point of view. So we're gonna start with third person point of view. Third person point of view uses a narrator to tell the story and you'll know it's third person because the narrator will use words like she, he, or they. So a lot of my favorite books are told in the third person. So I want to read you a quote from one of them today. So I'll read you this quote from The Giver by Lois Lowry that uses third person. His mind reeled, now empowered to ask questions of utmost rudeness and promised answers. He could conceivably, though it was almost unimaginable, ask someone, some adult, his father perhaps, do you lie? But he would have no way of knowing if the answer he received was true. So you can see that this is third person because it uses words like he, right? So that's what makes it third person. So the second type of point of view is second person point of view. And second person point of view features a narrator addressing someone from the you perspective. And you'll know it's second person because the narrator will use the word you, like I'm talking in second person just now. So this perspective is definitely much more rare in stories, but it does exist. Maybe some of you have read the Goosebumps Choose Your Own Adventure books. Those are often told in the second person point of view, as is the story book by Kwame Alexander. Like lightning you strike, fast and free, legs zoom downfield, eyes fixed on the checkered ball, on the gold 10 yards to go, can't nobody stop you, can't nobody cop you. Again, you can see that this is second person because it uses you. Okay, so the final point of view is first person point of view. And first person point of view tells the story from the eyes of one of the characters in the book. So you'll know it's first person because they'll use words like I, my, me, or even we if it's plural. Both great expectations 
and Park Racer game are written in the first person. I personally chose first person because I love getting deep into a character's mind and personality and being able to closely explore their thoughts. So even if Great Expectation wasn't told in the first person, I probably would have changed it to be the first person. So let's look at the first lines of both Great Expectations and Pippa Park Racer game for two examples of first person point of view. The first line of Great Expectations is, my father's family name being Parip and my Christian name Philip my infant tongue can make of both names nothing longer or more explicit than Pip. Meanwhile, the first line of my book is, I was the only person in the park. Tucking a damp strand of hair back behind one ear, I surveyed the abandoned slides and empty benches. So again, you can see that even though Great Expectations uses my and Pippa uses I, they're both examples of using the first person point of view. And if you have any questions about any of the things we just talked about, first person, second person, or third, just drop them in the chat below and we'll get to them in a few minutes. But meanwhile, let's start on actually making our own retelling together. So in the event description, there should have been a link to a worksheet that you can download and follow along to actually help create your own retelling. But if you don't have it, that's totally fine. You can get it afterwards on www.pippapark.com or you can just grab a piece of paper and a pen and you can follow along. Or if you feel just like listening along, then that's totally fine either. But I'll give you about 10 seconds if you want to grab a piece of paper and a pen. And then we'll get started on our own retellings together. So I'm super excited about that. And again, if you want to find the worksheet afterward, it's on my website, so don't worry if you don't have it. But if you do want to follow along and you have a pen, then we can get started. So the first step in creating our own retelling is you're going to pick a story that you've read, heard, or seen. And you're going to use this as the starting point for your own story. So if it's a book in the public domain, and remember that books in the public domain are just books that are old enough that the copyright no longer applies so that you can retell them. And that's amazing and fantastic. But right now, since we're just doing an exercise for fun together and you're not trying to sell your story, then it's also fine to choose a modern book or any book that you want. So today I'm gonna to be retelling, let's see, The Lightning Thief by Rick Riordan, which is the first book in the Percy Jackson and the Olympian series. And the reason I'm going to pick this book is because I think it's awesome and funny and hopefully a lot of you have read it as well so you'll kind of be able to follow along. But for those of you who haven't read this book, I'll give you a little summary. Basically, The Lightning Thief is about a young boy named Percy who finds out that he is a half god and his father is actually Poseidon, the Greek god of the sea. And so he goes to a place called Camp Half-Blood and teams up with the daughter of Athena, Annabelle, to actually go on this mission to stop a war brewing between all these Greek gods. So pretty exciting stuff. But remember, you can't actually re retell Percy Jackson and sell this book because it's copyrighted. So if you want to retell something that you can sell, you have to pick a book in the public domain. Just important reminder. OK, so now that you have a book that you like, you're going to think about why you like the story. Is it the central conflict or the relationship between the characters? Or maybe it's the interesting themes. So in Percy Jackson, maybe you really think it's awesome that Percy can control water and you want all of your characters to have superpowers too and you think that's really cool. That would be a perfect reason why you like the story. Or maybe you think that Percy's loyalty is really inspiring and you want your main character to be just as loyal as Percy. That would be another reason that you like the story. Anything is totally fine so long as you're thinking about what elements you like. And the reason I like to do this is because oftentimes when you're making a retelling, there are so many things that you have to cut that it's easy to lose track of why you chose a particular story in the first place. So by making a list of all the things that you do like about the story, you kind of know what elements you can keep and which elements you can change. So I'll give you following along just a couple seconds to write down a few things that you like about the story you chose. And then we'll move on to the next step. And again, if you have to, you know, if you need more time, then you can always download the worksheet or just ask me questions afterwards and we can kind of play with them together. Okay, so the third step in making your own retelling is you're going to brainstorm who the main character is and their personality and what you like about them and all of those other really cool details. But remember that just because I chose The Lightning Thief doesn't mean I have to choose Percy Jackson as my main character of my new book that I'm telling. For example, maybe some of you have seen the play Wicked. So Wicked is a retelling of The Wizard of Oz, but it's actually told from the point of view of the Wicked Witch of the West, so the villain of the story instead of Dorothy, the main character. So maybe you want to retell Percy Jackson and the Olympians from Luke's point of view because you think there's a lot to explore there. 
Or maybe you think that Annabelle is just really clever and you want to see more about her mind and how, what she's doing in other parts of the books. Or maybe you want to get really creative and you decide that there's a mysterious bird following the kids around through the entire series and you want the perspective to be from that random bird. What you choose or who you choose is not so important as just choosing a character and getting to know all these little details about them. So once you decide who is going to be the main character of the story, you want to brainstorm all about their personality and what they want, what they fear, even what flavor ice cream they like best. All those little details are going to help you get to know your character more, which is going to create a stronger protagonist for your story. So again, I'll give you a couple seconds to just jot down some thoughts about who you want your main character of the story to be. Okay, and so now one of our final steps is we're just gonna choose our point of view. So now we have a few details about what goes into the book, but now we should talk about the form of the book. So that's how are you going to tell your story? Do you really wanna get inside your character's head? Then maybe you stick with the first person that the lightning thief uses and you use I and me. Or maybe you want your reader to have as much information as possible, and so you switch to third person and use he, she, or they. Or maybe you just feel like a challenge, and so you decide second, per second person, which uses the you, is going to be the best way to tell your story. I don't think there are any bad point of view, but I think the most important thing to do is choose a point of view and have a reason for why you're choosing that perspective, because that's going to save you a lot of time in the long run. There's nothing worse than getting 200 pages into your story and realizing you want to completely change your point of view from I to you and you have to redo all of that hard work. So just choosing a point of view and having reasons why you chose that is going to help you out uh, immensely. Okay, so now that you have all of those little details down, really the last step in making your own retelling is just to write the first chapter of your story. So hopefully for y'all following along, you'll have a few things written down that will actually help you kind of kickboard your own story. And so I wish you a lot of luck with that and I bet they're gonna be amazing. So that will be really fun for y'all if you decide to do that. Okay, in a second I'll take questions, but first I just want to go through a couple takeaways from today. So one, we learned what a fractured classic is, which is just when you take a story and change it to tell a new story. Next, we learned about character development, which is finding ways to get inside a character's head. And I gave you three of the tips that I like to use, which include sketching my characters, making playlists for them, and actually taking personality quizzes for them. And finally, we talked about point of view, which is just telling the story from a particular perspective, either first, second, or third person. So if you have any questions about any of that stuff, feel free to drop them in the chat below. And then if you want, you can also visit my website, pimppark.com, to find more activities and also to read my blogs. I review a lot of books on there that I like. Or you can write a letter to me um, by emailing info at fablefilms.com. So I'd love to hear from you for any of that. And now I'm so happy to take questions. Y'all have been great. All right. Uh, so for questions, um, you know, y'all can drop them in the Q&A section. Um, also, if you want to, you know, raise your hand, um, I can allow you to talk. And as y'all start thinking of questions, I'm going to break the ice and ask a question that I've been thinking about for the past, like, two weeks. Um, so, Erin, when did you read Great Expectations? And, like, when did you decide that this is the story you wanted to retell? Like, what, right. it, how did that happen? That's a really great question. I actually read it for the first time in high school. And the funny thing is I remember actually not loving it exactly in high school, but then I reread it after college. And, you know, after about four or five years, I actually liked it so much more and thought there were such interesting themes and kind of character relationships. So one of the things that really made me want to retell the story was actually the kind of romance between the main character, Pip, and this girl, Estella, because a lot of times I'll read books and it'll be kind of like an insta-love thing where the girl and the boy like each other immediately. But in this case, it was like almost the exact reverse where the girl was kind of really cold and unfriendly to him throughout the entire story, but he was still like hopelessly in love with her. And I just thought that was so fascinating to me. So it kind of, that was really what got me wanting to retell this book specifically. Yeah, I, um, 
a lot of times with, you know, reading the first thing that I pick up on is like, uh, how realistic is this relationship and interaction? Um, right. And sometimes I love it, you know, I'm like, I'm in the mood for just like, you know, give me all like that hopeful, like love. And so I do like both, but yeah. All right. Y'all, y'all aren't, y'all haven't asked any questions. So maybe, um, some of y'all want to, in the Q and A, um, put what book you would be interested in retelling. Yeah, like maybe that. there is a, um, oh, okay. We do have a question. Uh, and one, they first, they loved Pippa Park so much and they were wondering if it was going to be a series. I'm so glad you love Pippa. That makes my heart so warm. So thank you for that. And well, I can't give you all too much information, but if we can kind of keep it between the library that I can tell you a little bit of a secret. So I am working on a sequel right now to Pippa Park. So um, I can't tell you too many details about it, but it's a little bit under wraps, but I can share that I am working on a sequel. That is so exciting. Congratulations. Well, thank you. I'm having a lot of fun with it right now, so. Uh, how did growing up in Texas influence your writing? Okay, yeah, so that's a great question. I think that it's interesting because I want to actually write a book set in Texas at one point in my life. This one wasn't set in Texas, but I think just some of those universal experiences of just, you know, growing up in like a kind of a suburban town in, you know, Frisco, Texas, were things that I could translate to this um, town, you know, in Massachusetts. So there are a lot of like surface details about like how, you know, a suburban town kind of feel felt to me. Um, but luckily, you know, in Massachusetts, there's a lot, there's not that stifling heat or anything like that. So I had a lot of fun actually having, you know, cold temperatures and kind of like, you know, creepy atmospheric rainstorms that I wouldn't get from Texas. But I love Texas so much that I would definitely want to set a book there one day. Very cool. Uh, and then Sydney wanted to know how long did it take you to write Pippa Park? Okay, so I think that it took about three months ish to write the first draft. I actually spent a while on the outline. I think like two months before that, just writing the outline. And I think it was about a 40 page outline. So once I started writing the book, it was actually quite fast. But then again, the editing phase took about three or four times as long. So altogether, probably about maybe like a year and a half to two years to write this book total. So yeah. What was, uh, you know, if you don't, if it's not like too personal, what was like your publishing experience like? Right, so my publishing experience was a little bit different in that I don't have an agent, but I work directly with a publishing house. And it was really cool to have this collaborative experience. So like, you know, I oftentimes think of writers as being kind of solitary creatures and kind of working alone. But the really cool thing about actually publishing a book is that you're not alone and that you have, you know, you're working with an editor and you're working with like marketing people who, bring a lot of support to the table. So my editor was actually the editor of the Goosebumps series. So working with her was really um, a fun experience that I totally loved. So yeah, that was a really great process for me. I love Goosebumps. I'm so jealous. <laughs> um, uh, so do you, uh, do you still live in Texas? So I actually just moved back from New York to Texas one month ago. So um, I'm hopefully going to grad school in like a year. And so I'm gonna spend a year in Texas too before then. Yeah, oh, happy to cool. come though. Where I miss the donuts here? You miss the donuts? I do. Uh, Texas has amazing donuts and kolaches. That's something that I definitely missed out in New York. Uh, where are you planning on going to grad school? I have no idea yet. I'm applying to about five or six, but one of my top choices is actually Trinity University in Dublin. So maybe I'll actually be there in a year. Fingers crossed. That would be so cool. It would be very exciting. Um, if one day, a long time in the future, you know, get, Pippa gets to take a, a basketball field trip to yeah. Ireland. Right, right. That would be an amazing experience. It's a <laughs> lot of research, you know. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right. Does, uh, does anyone else have any other questions or want to share anything about, um, you're welcome to share if, you know, if you have an idea for a retelling um, or maybe you're an aspiring young writer, 
Um, if you have any questions just about the writing process, you know, all of those questions are fair game. Um, Aaron, I know that you talked about writing every day. Right, yeah. And so when did you start writing a little bit of something every day? Well, I think that I grew up as a child actually writing almost every day. And I think that you definitely should give yourself a day off, you know, like, you know, one or two days off a week. But I really did as probably when I was like in fifth grade or sixth grade, start tinkering on my little novels and short stories almost every day. And then of course you're gonna go through periods of time like in college and stuff when you're, you can't do that and the, you shouldn't feel hard on yourself for not being able to do that. But I just find it, it's a good goal for myself and I'm happier when I'm writing a little bit every day. So yeah, for all, probably from childhood. <laughs> And I always say that if you're not writing every day, then reading every day can be an awesome thing to do too, because I think that's just awesome for your writing process as well. Oh, this is a good one. This is about one of your favorite um, character story development um, yeah. methods, the Spotify playlist. Right. How do you choose the songs for Pippa Park? Well, so I think I took a lot of inspiration from what Pippa listens to, for when I was around that age. And so we both share a lot of like, you know, K-pop songs that we like. And then I also took inspiration from some of her friends. So I knew that one of her best friends, Buddy, was really into like, you know, 80s and 90s rock. And so I was like, well, if her best friend is into that, then I know that she's also gonna be listening to that. So I try to think about just what age she is and also what her friends would influence her to listen to as well. And then a lot of the songs I picked also just kind of describe less of like what she would listen to and more about her personality. And so those are also really fun for me. Very cool. Uh, so uh, when you were writing Pippa Park specifically, uh, did, you, did you have writer's block? Do you ever have writer's block when you're writing? So I definitely do have writer's block a lot when I'm writing. But one thing about Pippa is I didn't have too much writer's block because I think the longest outline I've ever written was for Pippa. And so I did have like 40 pages of just pure notes for how I wanted the story to go. And so I found that was really helpful in just keeping the writer's block at bay because I kind of knew every time I got to a hard spot where the next point would be. But when I do have like, you know, scenes that I'm not sure about how to write, I think a really good tip that I like to use is just going to a completely different scene, not even in the same chapter, but maybe like a couple chapters ahead because then for example, I love writing dialogue. So if I'm writing a really fun dialogue scene, then I get like those creative juices flowing. And so when I go back to the hard scene, I feel just a little bit more optimistic about it. And I find that really helps me. Yeah, you know, uh, definitely having, you know, an outline uh, right. can help. And, you know, giving yourself a break by writing something you're really looking forward to. Right. Okay, so we have a couple more questions. Um, people are getting more excited about asking them. I love um, that. Okay, so uh, do you get to meet other authors? So I have met a lot of other authors that I really admire at different book conferences when I like go to sign books or things. So I always have to stop myself from like devolving from just like an author to like a total fangirl reader, you know, like just not talking about my book at all and just going to meet like other people's writings and like talking to them. So that's one thing that I really love um, just seeing other authors. So I do get to see a couple of them, but in general in life, I don't actually know that many of my friends who are authors. So it's really cool to actually be in a space where I can talk to other authors and I feel like I can get a lot of advice and mentorship from them too. So it's really something that I love. Very cool. Um, so I know you alluded to a potential book in the works. Uh, <laughs> any idea when any next book by you would be out? Well, that's so hard because publishing sometimes, you know, it can be so unpredictable, especially, you know, now. And so mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure when the date for that book will be, but I am writing a lot of other books on the side too. And so I'd love to like write actually a middle grade horror book. So that's something that I really am excited about. So I'm kind of in the outline phase for a couple of those. Um, but I'm not sure when the next Pippa will be out specifically. All right. Um, so how, on your like normal day, how long do you usually spend writing? It's a very hard question to answer because I feel like there's almost no normal day where it's like, <laughs> I try to write, you know, like 
15 to 20 minutes a day, just like writing something small, even if it's just writing in my diary, like completely unrelated to like creative writing. But sometimes I'll write, you know, like four hours and I'll be up until like five in the morning, just, you know, if I have an idea. So it really does bounce around. But um, I think that I love those days where I can write five hours and like stay up all night, you know, it feels really good. Yeah, that's, I, I think the latest uh, I've stayed up is, uh... 10 30 p.m recently i'm i'm definitely not a night owl <laughs> i'm definitely a night owl i'm like if i have to be up before 10 a.m you know i'll have like two cups of coffee one in each hand <laughs> um so like you mentioned earlier um you definitely have to read a lot yeah. um for writing um so do you still read a lot and um you know if so what are some cool books that you've read recently? Yeah, um, I've been reading a lot recently because I've been inside a lot. And so I think in the last probably two weeks, I've read about six books. So probably, you know, like a book every couple of days. Some of the ones I've really liked lately were Stand Up Yumi Chung by Jessica Kim was a great like middle grade contemporary book. If you love humor or Netflix specials, I'd highly recommend checking that one out. And also if you like, you know, Korean barbecue, you definitely want to flock to that one. Um, so that would be kind of like, um, a contemporary read. And then if you like more fantasy, I think that Charlie Hernandez and the Book of Shadows was awesome, like completely great. If you like The Lightning Thief by Rick Riordan, I think you would definitely love that. It has a lot of like Latin American mythology that kind of informs the book. So those would be one recommendation for a fantasy and one for like a more contemporary read. Very cool. So uh, we have um, who I think is an aspiring young writer Oh, awesome. asking that uh, how long does it take to get over writer's block? And they did say that they feel like they've had it for a few weeks. For a few weeks? Well, I guess that depends on if you're having writer's block just for any kind of writing or if you're having writer block for a particular story. So my advice would be if you're having writer's block for a particular story and skipping ahead a couple scenes isn't working for you, then maybe just try switching to writing maybe a short story or just in a new genre and see if that kind of gets your brain flowing in ways that it wasn't before. So I find that actually helps a lot. Sometimes I like to actually uh, switch back and forth between novel writing and script writing and I find that really kind of boosts my creative energy. So that would be kind of my first suggestion. Okay, so you said the word script and we know about your Broadway history. Do well, you, are you, have you been working on like a, a script version of Pippa Park? Oh, well, no, no script version of Pippa Park. Okay. Although I would love to see that, um, you know, if that ever happened one day in the future, I'd be like, you know, head over heels for that. Um, but I do like to work more on like, you know, animated shows. So I think that I'm working on a couple of those, just like having fun um, in the meantime. I spent most of my life writing books, you know, so it was only the last two or three years I got more interested in television writing as well. But I just find it really fun to kind of switch back and forth between them. But Very yeah, it was actually cool. interesting because I wasn't writing for the Broadway show. I was actually just a debate coach. So it was very interesting to kind of have that completely unrelated part of my life, like, you know, to be watching a Broadway show and also just be like a debate coach on it. Um, it was just really cool to see this different method of writing that I've never tried before. So it has got me interested, you know, and like maybe one day I can also like start writing plays too. Like it was very inspiring to watch them work. Very exciting. Um, okay. So uh, we got in a lot of questions. Um, so I think um, these next couple questions may be some of our last questions, um, but so um, we have some questions about um, kind of what you like to read. So what kind of books are your favorite? Um, maybe your favorite series, uh, your favorite authors. Yeah. And uh, whether or not you like to read myths. Okay, great. So for in terms of what I like to read, I really like to read almost everything. I love YA and middle grade um, specifically. And so I think I'm about 10 pages um, away from finishing You Should See Me in a Crown right now. And that book is just fantastic. I'm going to go finish it right after this, you know. So I love that kind of, you know, almost rom com -y kind of books. So that's a big genre that I like. But I'm also a huge fan of horror books. So I think that Ellen O oh is also one of my favorite authors. Her book, Spirit Hunters, um, features, you know, a half Korean girl too. And that book is just 
amazing if you like horror and kind of spooky things. So I do like to read just all across the spectrum. Um, and it is really hard for me to just pick favorite authors and favorite book series because I feel like oftentimes I'll read one book from an author and I'll just love that book, but um, I won't have read everything. But I think one of my favorite authors is actually Douglas Adams from The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I've actually visited his cemetery um, a couple times, um, you know, and left a pin just to like pay a little bit of tribute to him. Um, and then I think the last question was, do I like to read mythology, right? Um, mm -hmm. I actually do love that. So Greek mythology was a huge one when I was a kid. Um, so, you know, the Rick Riordan was also one of my favorite authors growing up. All of his books were fantabulous. And I also am reading now a lot of Irish mythology, actually. I have like my book of Irish and, um, you know, fairy folklore that I'm really enjoying. So just, I do definitely like to read mythology. Very cool. Um, and for any of you who are wondering, you know, Pippa Park raises her game. It came out in February of this year. So it is a relatively new book and it is, you know, Erin's debut book. Um, so y'all are getting to hear her talk about her writing and her writing process while she's kind of like new and fresh on the scene. And so like, that's so exciting. Um, you know, because for years to come, you're going to see great stuff, um, you know, come out from her and you'll be like, oh my gosh, I remember when her first book came out. And yeah, so um, we did have someone ask uh, when the book was published and, you know, it is, you know, it's like, you know, back in February, you got to have your first ever book birthday, which yeah. is, you know, like the fun term for when your book comes to life finally. Um, yeah, super exciting. <laughs> Yeah, um, so uh, we do have a young writer here, and so um, she's been working on a book for about a year now, and she's editing it. Do you have any tips for editing? Well, that's amazing. So congratulations on finishing your book. That's a huge accomplishment, so that's awesome. In terms of advice for editing, I think one of the things that I sometimes struggle with is I would have a lot of chapters where I thought I had really funny material in and like good things going, but they wouldn't really advance the plot at all. So they wouldn't take the plot forward. And so I had to learn to get comfortable with cutting out a lot of the things I liked, just because even though I thought they were good, they didn't necessarily help move the book forward. So I think my advice would be get comfortable just kind of copying and pasting and putting in a separate Word document the parts that you like that you're gonna have to delete. So they're there for you and you can still look at them, but that you you know ultimately do what's best for your book. and get it in that kind of shape that it needs to be. So it can be hard, but um, a necessary pain sometimes. Yes, very important. And also, you know, like you said, you know, the editing process is kind of a community process. Right. And so, um, you know, if for, you know, young writers, you know, it's good to find other young writers to Definitely. read your work and get some feedback and they can be good tools in that editing. So you already have uh, you already have fans who are definitely going to buy your next book when it comes out. Oh, that's um, amazing. Yeah. Um, okay. And I know you've already recommended uh, several books um, to us. I know you mentioned that you write book reviews. You review a lot of books. Yeah. Yeah. So where um, where can the teens go and find your book reviews um, so that they can keep up with kind of like everything you're reading? Oh, that'd be awesome. So actually on my website, pippapark.com, you can go to like the blog section and I update um, there with some of the books I'm reading. So uh, you can find most of my reviews there actually. Okay, yeah. So if any of y'all are looking for your next great reads and you've already finished Pippa Park and you're like, man, I like Erin so much. I want to read everything she recommends. That is where you go. You go to pippapark.com and you can read all the books that she's recommending right now. Um, Oh, okay. This is an interesting question. Can anyone publish book or can anyone of any age publish books or is there a certain age requirement? That is a great question. And I don't think there is, there's definitely not an age requirement. I think that I'm trying to remember the book. I think it's Aragon where the author was probably like, maybe I want to say, I could be totally wrong, but I think like 13 or 14 when they first published Aragon, which went on to sell a huge amount of copies. So that would be like one success story. So it really isn't about your age. It's just about like, you know, the merits of your book. And so um, if you have your book published, it's never too early to start, you know, querying agents and sending out like 
summaries of your book to agents and trying to get those deals. And so I'm looking forward to hopefully seeing your books on the shelves too. Uh, yeah, I know uh, Gordon Corman, hmm. um, his, his first book I think came out when he was 14. Oh, it was like that. a yeah, um, it was a, like a school project or something. And he said he got a B on the project. Really? And then um, it became his first series um, an awesome that he published. Yeah, I, hopefully I'm remembering the author right. It's, I read it in a, um, you know, like a kid's uh, chapter book, you know, all the authors talking about when they started right. writing and stuff. Um, and I was like, oh my gosh, you had a book deal at 14? Uh, I know, that's a big deal. And I know that NaNoWriMo, like if y'all have heard of that, it's coming up in November. And a lot of people, like that's a good push to kind of keep you accountable for finishing a book if you're interested in that. Yeah, so NaNoWriMo National Novel Writing Month. Um, and definitely if you um, are interested in that, uh, you know, please, um, you know, send me an email. Um, we've been trying to gauge some interest in, you know, per potentially participating through the library with that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, um, you know, Aragon, uh, the author did write it when he was 15. Mm -hmm. um, and it finally was published when he was 19. So sometimes that publishing process takes a little right. bit of time. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so do we have any final any last questions? No? Okay, I will ask my last question, which is, um, what, you know, wise words of wisdom would you like to leave our, you know, young writers and readers with today? I think the wise words of wisdom I would have is just, you know, believe in yourself above everything else. And just, if you want something, keep writing and, you know, def luck, definitely luck plays a huge role in it, but like your passion is what helps you succeed. And so just, you have to be your biggest advocate and believe in yourself, you know, no matter what other people tell you or like what the world tells you, as long as you have that belief, like you're your biggest supporter. And I think that is what helps me a little bit too, so. But a big thank you to Morgan and a big thank you to Cosby Library and everyone watching. Y'all have just been amazing. So I've been so happy to be here today. Yes, and we are so happy to have you. Um, and we, um, <laughs> we uh, one of our uh, attendees said she's so excited about a new book and um, she, uh, she hopes to see it soon. So uh, if you weren't feeling the pressure from uh, some other forces, you now at least have, you know, one um, Capel, Capellian out there just, you know, holding their breath till your next no, book. I'm ready, I'm ready for y'all. <laughs> yeah, and hopefully, um, you know, when that next book comes out, um, maybe you'll still be in the area or making trips yeah. in the area. And maybe, you know, I know that doing an author visit in person is a little bit. I would love to see y'all in person at like, some point in the future, you know, like that would be yeah. amazing. Yeah, I know virtual is nice and everything and it's safe and that's great. Uh, but, uh, you know, hopefully one day we can have you in the library for reals. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, so everyone, ah, oh, yes. And you're just, you're getting lots of praise in the chat. Uh, oh, yes, I know. I appreciate that so much. So we are going to go ahead and call it a wrap for today, y'all. Um, I definitely encourage you to check out Erin's website. She does have some other Pippa Park activities um, on there, too. Um, I believe a Pippa Park escape room. Yes, that's super fun. I've played it once. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, I encourage you... Um, with your books, you've got um, three of the activity worksheets, and I think some of those will be fun for you um, to think about, you know, songs that relate to your characters. Um, and, you know, definitely, uh, if you haven't finished Pippa Park Raises Her Game, that should be on your to-do list for today. Um, and then uh, everyone give a big virtual and silent applause to Erin. Thank you, Erin. Thank y'all. <laughs> okay, have a great day, y'all. Bye.